Hello and welcome to Starfish Maths. My name's Sarah and today I want to look at integration. Integration is the opposite of differentiation. So if your confidence isn't solid yet on differentiation, then I do recommend you do a little bit more practice and maybe check out my other video on differentiation first. Today we're going to look at definite and indefinite integration. There's quite a lot to cover, so the difficulty level is going to increase quite quickly as we progress through the content. Do feel free to skip around the video and take this at your own pace. And as ever, please do grab a pen and paper, pause the video and have a go at the questions yourself as we go through. I'll start off by showing you the basics of how to integrate, quickly going through difficulty of integrating more complex terms. We'll then look at the application of integration, looking at the area under a curve and finish up with an exam question. I hope this is helpful. Let's get started. Starting with a very basic function then, if we differentiate x squared, then we know we get 2x. I've written up here to differentiate u times and take, meaning u times the power down to the front to get a, two, a coefficient of 2, then take 1 away from the power to leave you with 1. Now different, integrating sorry, is the opposite of differentiation, so if we start with 2x and integrate, we should get x squared. I've written up here in, to integrate, add and divide. So add 1 to the power first to get 2, and then divide the coefficient by the power, 2 divided by 2 to get 1. Using another example, add 1 to the power here to get 4, and then divide the coefficient by 4 to get 2. And just checking that if you differentiate 2x to the power of 4, you do get 8x cubed. Now the language of integration uses this integration sign and a dx around the function that you want to integrate. So if we wanted to integrate 10x to the power of 4, we'd encase it in this language to say we want to integrate 10x to the 4 with respect to x. Now let's integrate. Add and divide. So 4 becomes 5 and divide 10 by 5 to get 2. Now one more thing, when we're using indefinite integration like this, we also need to add a constant. That constant, c, could stand for any number, but we don't know what it is. The reason for that is if you started with a number here, plus 3 for example, and differentiate it, you'd lose that, that 3 would vanish. So when we start from this side, we don't know if there was a constant that vanished in the process of differentiating. So to cater for that we need to put a plus c even though we don't know what it is. That might sound a little bit fussy but it's incredibly important and if you're asked an indefinite integration in an exam and forget the plus c then you would lose a mark. So do you get in the habit of writing plus c, it's really important. Let's do a little bit more practice of that now. We're going to look at three examples of indefinite integration now, increasing in difficulty. So pause the video and have a go, or skip this section if you don't need it. So for each term, I've added 1 to the power and divided by that. In this case, 6 divided by 3, that gives us a nice whole number. But for this one, we just leave it as a fraction. This term here was a number, and remember, it's the reverse of differentiating. If we differentiate 9x, then you're just left with 9. So when you integrate a number, just stick an x on it. And, of course, remembering plus c. This question looks more complex. It's not yet ready in the form it's in now to integrate. We need to prepare it to integrate by expanding out the brackets, so let's do that. Now we can integrate. Well done if you got that one right. Let's do the last example. This question is a bit ludicrously complicated, but I just want to show you what happens with more complex indices. Again, it's not ready yet to integrate. We need to prepare it for integration by writing all these terms with powers on the top. So let's do that first. Okay. 
Okay, if you got there, well done. It takes a little bit of practice to get these indices. Careful when you're doing the fractions. If you add 1 to 3 over 2, it's 5 over 2. I've just written those fractions on the bottom, even though that looks messy. We'll tidy that up in a second. And also be careful when you're adding 1 to negative numbers. Um, obviously, the common mistake here would be to put minus 3, not minus 1. We can now tidy that up. If you're dividing by a fraction, then what you're doing is times thing by the reciprocal. So that fraction flips upside down to become 2 over 3. Another way you can think about that is if you're dividing by a fraction, then the bottom number flips up to the top. So you get 2 over 3. I realise I've made a mistake here, I put an X on the bottom when it shouldn't have been. Um, and when you tidy that up, you've got a minus and a minus making a plus. Let's now move on to look at the application of integration. So integration is a really useful and powerful tool to be able to do. Um, it's got some really practical applications. What the main one is using it to find the area under a curve. Remember that differentiation is used for rates of change, but also to find the gradient of a curve. Integration is used to find the area under a curve. We're going to look at this graph. So to start with, we're going to sketch the graph. I'm going to do that by finding where the curve crosses the x and y axes. And we'll do that by setting x and y equal to zero. Have a go at doing that yourself. Okay, this is a, if you expanded this out, you can see it's a negative quadratic, which is why you know it has that shape. And we found where it crossed the axes, so we know how to sketch it. If we now integrate this function, what it will do is give us the area between the curve and the x-axis between two limits. Now we can set those limits anywhere we like. If, for example, we set um, a limit at 1 and 4, then what it would do by integrating is give us the area between the curve and the x-axis between 1 and 4. Let's make our bandwidth for now 5 and minus 2, and that will give us the area between the curve and the x-axis under that whole section, so between 5 and minus 2. Now, when we use integration to find the area, this is called definite integration. And when we do this, we need limits, which we write by the integration sign. And what we do is integrate the function and substitute in those two numbers and take them away from each other. So let's start by integrating. We can't integrate just yet as it is. We need to expand out the brackets. Now I've integrated that, we generally tend to put that in square brackets and then write the limits on the end. And we now plug in these two different numbers into all of that expression and take them away from each other. When we do that, if there was the plus c which we're used to, the constant, it would get minus from itself. So we don't need to write the plus c, we don't need to bother with that when we do definite integration. Of course, you can stick all that into your calculator, but be really careful as you go. There's loads of places for mistakes, especially with minus signs. So take it nice and slowly and carefully. Well done if you got that right. As I said, there's loads of places where we can make mistakes. Um, so do check your work carefully and check mine as well. If you notice that I make any mistakes, just let me know. Let's look at one more example like that and then do an exam question. Okay, we're going to look at a cubic this time. So just like the last example, let's first try and sketch this graph by finding where it crosses the x and y axes. Quick 
Great, now we have the graph so we know what it looks like. And I wanted to use this example because this has a little bit above the x-axis and a little bit below the x-axis. So that area there, when we integrate it, it'll give us a positive area and this bit will give us a negative area. Now if, for example, you find the area under here is 5, so negative 5, and the area above here is 2, so positive 2, if you integrate all the way straight off from 3 to minus 2, what that will do is take minus 5 and plus 2 and give you a total area of 3. That's not quite what we want. What we want is the total area combined of these two things. So in effect, this area here, we want to call that positive. So then the total area would be 7. So because we need to change the sign of this area, we'll need to do that one separately. So we need to do two different integrations, one from 3 to 0 and the other one from 0 to minus 2. Let's start by doing the positive integration from 0 to minus 2. Okay, as expected, we've got a positive result, so that's that little area there. Now let's do the same thing for the negative um, area. We've already integrated it, so we don't need to go through that process again, but we just need to change the limits to 3 and 0. So now putting these together, we can change the sign of this negative one to make it positive, because when we talk about area, we're talking about positive spaces and add those together to get a total. Well done if you followed all that. There's quite a lot going on in there, what with sketching the graph, integrating and doing the two separate areas and using the signs, changing minus to plus and everything. So do replay that and do that a couple of times if you need to. Okay, so this is an exam question taken from an Edexcel 2012 paper. Uh, I think it's uh, the core two paper, question five. And what they ask is to find the coordinates of A and B and then to go on and find the shaded region there, which is labelled R. First of all, we're going to find the coordinates of A and B and we're going to do that by setting the two equations equal to each other. We've got the equation of a curve in blue and the equation of a straight line. So if we set them equal to each other using simultaneous equations, then we can find the coordinates of A and B. OK, we found the x-coordinates, but we're not quite done. We need to substitute them back into one of these equations to get the y-coordinates as well. This one's easier, so let's do that. And there we go, we found the coordinates of a and b. Well done if you got that. Clearly my sketch isn't to scale here, but you get the idea. We can mark those coordinates on. Alright, now to find the area of the shaded region. As we've done before, if we integrate the curve equation, it will give us the area between the curve and the x-axis between the two limits that we choose. Here we'll choose these x-coordinates, 9 and 2. What that will give us is the whole of this region under the curve, between the curve and the x-axis here. So we'll do that first, and then we can take off the bit we don't want. So let's go ahead and integrate that. All right, so that's that whole area under the curve. We, of course, don't want this bit here. And that is the shape of a trapezium. So you'll know the area of a trapezium from GCSE. <laughs> Sorry, that was my grandfather clock chiming there. Okay, so let's find the area of this trapezium. It might help to you to sketch that out so you can get the length of the trapezium. The area of a trapezium, if you need reminding, is a half a plus b times the height. Um, to get the length, we'll use the coordinates. So this length here is 1, this length is 8. 
And the difference between 2 and 9 is obviously 7. Putting that together then, the area of the shaded region is the area from the integral. Take away the area of the trapezium, which gives us a grand total of 3, 4, 3 over 6. Which, by sheer coincidence, is the same answer as we got from another question that we did. But that's just luck. Um, this is quite a common sort of exam question where you use an integration and you also need to use a little bit of creative thinking to find either the area of a trapezium or it might also be a triangle. So just be aware of that. Do plenty of practice of those sorts of questions. I hope this all was helpful. Carry on practicing and have fun.